I am here to talk to you about one of my favourite villains ever, and it's probably the most cartoonish villain that I've ever seen written in a module, and that's good ol' Aserak. Um, now, I would like you to keep in mind that out of all of the modules that set up a large key villain, Aserak is the most backseat, uh, hidden, pretty much unknown one, and I think that's perfectly fine. If you never reveal a single inkling that it's Aserak doing this until the very end, he's doing his job, because Aserak is kind of like off on his own, doing his own thing really, uh, and what's happening in the story isn't that important to him. He's probably on another plane doing some other stuff and then gets interrupted, you know what I mean? So he's a very backseat presence in comparison to, you know, there's modules like Curse of Strahd where Strahd is directly the entire influence over everything. There's Waterdeep Dragon Heist where there's a bunch of villains all doing various things very actively in the city. And there's, you know, Icewind Dale with the presence of Aurel hanging over everyone session one. Um, and granted, you discover that a bit later, but Aserak if you run it as the module is presented, you're probably not gonna know it's him like until the boss fight, if you know what I mean. Obviously there's the cover of course, but I, I've cho I chose to make him slightly more present, but still he's, he's yet to show up or influence the party in any way. The closest thing was a small dream that he casted on someone like the dream spell, and just mess with them a bit, and was just like, yeah, lol, we'll do that. Aserak is one of my favorite villains for a number of reasons. Whenever he's doing his own shenanigans, it's not really him. It, he's, he sets things up and then leaves and lets the things do the talking. Some of the lore behind Aserak is that he builds all these huge, complex, annoying trap dungeons uh, that are rumored to have a bunch of treasure inside to lure adventurers in, kill them, that feed him and his soul and stuff like that and give him more longevity. So he has like a bunch of tombs and like dungeons and stuff like that scattered across the world that are just, you know, passive income for him, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, and even if people complete it, it's like, oh, I'll just make another one in a bit. It'll take me a few days, whatever. Uh, stuff like that. And that's interesting lore behind him and kind of makes him uh, a more, I don't know, like it, it, there's so much quest potential out of that. There's a, there's a dungeon somewhere that's rumoured to have the Sword of Stars in it. Go find it, and then it's a Serac pulling funny pranks on you and making you want to die. Another thing is that he's pretty cartoon villain-esque. Uh, he wants to, you know, destroy the world, overrun it with undead. As you would, as a lich. That's kind of what most of them do, i found. And it's a simple enough motivation that moves the party to help, because the problem that's happening in Tomb of Annihilation is happening in the entire world but it's Chult that's mostly the hot pot for the activity of the bad guy, if you know what I mean. There's plenty of things that are going on in the adventure that pertain to Aserak himself, uh, however, they're very indirect. So, the things that are influenced by the undead happening constantly, so there's the wreck of the star something uh, or other, there's various places that were once active and full of life that are now completely desolate due to events that have happened before. Mesro with the Spell Plague, um, you know, you've got Nangalore with, I think, the Spell Plague. <laughs> the Spell Plague fucked a lot of things up. But there's always the influence of um, Serac in little, little, little sprinkles, you know what I mean? But it's barely him himself, which he he's... In comparison to other adventures where by the end everyone will despise Strahd and want to kill him ASAP, fighting a Serac is more of like a business thing. It's like a... right, so basically how the boss fight goes is they fight the Soulmonger first, and then after they do that, a Serac's like, oh, well that went shit, alright, let's go check it out, and walks through a portal like two seconds afterwards like, you're done did fucked up, and then kills them all. That's what Azarak does. And yeah, that's that's kind of a cool way of doing it. Like, he doesn't even acknowledge the party's presence until the very end, where he's like, you're a minor inconvenience. Um, for reference, when I play him in a few sessions, because my party are 23 sessions in, and um, are one floor away from being on a Serac's floor, I'm gonna make him be French because the battle music that I have for him is a uh, Frederick Chopin song. <laughs> so, it makes sense. 
If you want to do that, go, go for it. What I see typically people go for is um, a kind of enunciated British accent, if you will, which is perfectly fine. Just appropriate us all you like and make us your villains. <laughs> um, that's what we're for, man. In, uh, and I think French people can make just as good villains, you know. Just so happens that Aserak is likely to surrender in the fight. <laughs> I'm joking. He doesn't do that, he runs away. So let's talk a little bit about combat. Uh, there's a couple of things that I've seen people talk about that are a bit lackluster with his kit, and I do not agree at all. Uh, and that's his level 1 to 3 in cantrip spell list. So he's an archlich, so he has a bunch of spells all over the place. And I think that it's perfectly fine that his 3rd, 2nd and 1st levels are kind of dog shit, uh, and don't really work. Uh, I'll bring it up properly here to go over it a little bit. But I've seen people make like improved stat blocks of a Serac where he could, where he has fireball. And he has like wish just there, and that's like fucking. How are you gonna? How are you gonna have a had like a bad guy that you're fighting have wish? A Serac canonically has wish. Yes, that's entirely true. But don't give him wish. That's an awful idea. <laughs> There's other stuff as well, like giving him firebolt and stuff like that. That basically broadens his options way more, and everything just encourages him to just keep on kiting the party, which is really, really lame. So let's let's go over the spells that he gets. Um, his best at will, because he gets to um, for a legendary action cast an at will spell. Um, he has ray of sickness and ray of frost. They're, they're good ones. And then counter spell, but that doesn't apply for the legendary action. Animate dead does work since in the boss room there's a bunch of like bones piled up. Um, but other than that, overall, not a great spell list for one to three, including cantrips. I don't care. The fact that it's a little more restricted in terms of that and that he doesn't have, you know, firebolt, scorching ray, magic missile, stuff like that let's players have a bit more of a chance of actually fighting him outside of his turn. Because outside of his turn, the, the best stuff that he has is like some AoE damage stuff and paralyzing touches and uh, frightening gaze, which is really not a concern for my party with two level 10 paladins <laughs> who are just immune to that and anyone around them is as well. He also has other options, of course being a lich, power word kill, and he also has time stop. Time stop you can get real creative with, especially with his spell list. He has a couple of spells here that you could probably use uh, in quick juncture in order to set up a cool combo. So he could time stop, then teleport to somewhere, then make a wall of force, trapping someone who can't teleport in with him, 1v1. Someone who preferably isn't as good in melee as well. So perhaps, I don't know, if there's a cleric. A cleric would likely be the best target for that. However, he would get bonked pretty bad with radiant damage, but hey, he's not just not resistant to radiant in comparison to everything else, so hey. There's plenty of cool strategies that you can do with that um, as well. He has a lot of just big nuke spells that he can have up, so you could drop like a... He could drop like a whole monster and then chain that with a paralyzing touch, and then once they're paralyzed from that, I don't know, do something else. Well, that's not really how it works in the rules, I guess. If he's in melee, then he has options as well, and outside of that, he's got paralyzing touch, and if they're already paralyzed, he can start spamming shocking grasps on them uh, and stuff like that. Uh, I do like how he can only cast one spell of fourth level or higher a turn. So it does create more of a thing that as a DM you're going to have to think more about what he's going to do. He has a lot of single target big damage spells, which I think is good because then he can pick a certain target, reduce their health to the point where he could power word kill them and then power word kill them, which instantly murders them. And I think something important to note, and I actually talked to my players about this as they entered the dungeon, um, I said that the dungeon's pretty cutthroat, and so are the enemies in there, which was a subtle hint to us, Eric. Uh, and I just said that I am not holding back, and I will be planning to kill you just as everything else is to try and keep that level of um, authenticity. And that's exactly what I'm going to be doing with this Eric. I have plenty of contingency plans in my mind of what a Serac will do in a fight, etc., etc. And I think that that's somewhat important to do when you have a more intelligent foe. 
Uh, I know that it might be a little daunting. Uh, the module doesn't provide too many large strategies for a Serac in that room, so it's really up to you to kind of improvise. But if you take the time to look into his kit and come up with your own cool combos with what spells that it gives you, I think you're, you're, that your players will be truly terrified. Especially by like any time stop combo that you pull, just remember that it um, stops if you do something that like affects someone else. The spell ends if one of your actions during this period, or any effects that you create during this period, affects a creature other than you, or an object being worn or carried by someone other than you. So, Wall of Force Trap would definitely work, since it doesn't technically affect anyone. There's also something like, you could perhaps have him set up an Animate Dead or two if he has the time. Could maybe even... If he doesn't have Mind Blank on right now, put that on, etc, etc, and gear himself up to royally fuck over someone. But yeah, that's that's kind of what I'd recommend. I imagine there's more detailed strategy videos on a Serax combat out there that you should definitely check out. Um, I'm not much of a combat head in terms of how I do things. I more think of what makes sense for the moment. However, with a Serac, what makes sense for the moment is big strategy, so therefore that's what's gonna happen, you know what I mean? There's a couple other things that you'll probably need to know, like a Serac, if he dies, will come back in a D10 days by his phylactery, which you can choose where it is. Don't tell the players, they should never know where a Serac's phylactery is, unless you wanna make an entire adventure about that later. He has some other things. Don't underestimate the staff bonk. It does an average of 18 damage if you hit, and it's plus 11 to hit. Not bad, not bad, considering that the other one's like a paralysis thing, and if you chain that up, Paralysis, bonk, that's a crit, so an average of maybe 30 damage. Nice. There is also an option that could very easily take someone out. As an action, he can choose to invoke a curse with his staff that makes someone make a DC 23 con save. And they can't regain hit points, which is kind of bad if you've got like a main cleric up there healing everyone. And the vulnerability to necrotic damage that it gives is mental if you chain that next turn with a finger of death you're automatically dealing at least 75 damage to them or something stupid if they succeed their save on that. So definitely consider some of the options there. Uh, that would also work with uh, Circle of Death, and you could kind of use some of his actions as the uh, fight continues to continue spreading that curse to others so that you can chain a massive Circle of Death to absolutely fuck with the party a lot. There's also Disintegrate. If someone's pretty low and has a bad deck save, a Serac can do that. And there's a couple other ones that more simple here, like Blight and the like. Something to note, however, is that a Serac, due to him not being in his lair, will not be able to regain spell slots or do any of that sort of stuff. So he does have to be slightly reserved with his big nuke stuff. I definitely recommend always holding onto one ninth level for that big power word kill. You could also set up something at the start with like a just, I'm gonna cast Maze on the, the biggest threat to me right now, and they're gone until someone gets it, uh, until concentration's removed and stuff like that. Uh, finally, there's a Sphere of Annihilation that he control. Uh, he can control. Check the rules on the Sphere of Annihilation. In essence, he can choose to move it, as well as with a Legendary action if he needs to. And it'll soar towards people. I'd imagine they'd get a deck save. If they don't, that would be stupid, because it's properly projectiling towards them. So yeah, also keep that in mind. It can kind of be an extra feature to have on the map. Players can choose to try and control it, if they learn about its properties, but they're likely to fail doing so, because it requires a contested arcana check with a Serac, who has a plus 22. So, eh. <laughs> In any case, hopefully you found this kind of helpful. Went over a bit of his lore and what you could maybe do with him, and then also some combat stuff. If you uh, like the video, then click the like button that shows us that you did in fact like the video. You can comment and subscribe for the algorithm. Thank you very much. And we also have a Discord that you can join down in the description uh, as well. And we also have an Instagram that we don't really update. But hey, you can see stuff there <laughs> if you really want. Uh, thank you very much. See ya. Oh.